Hi. In this lesson, we're going to talk about Arizona water law. And when we talk about water, there are two major categories. The first is surface water. And surface water would be water flowing in rivers, existing in lakes, in streams, and also runoff. The other category of water is groundwater, water percolating below the surface. So let's first talk about surface water. In Arizona, we recognize what's known as the doctrine of prior appropriation. That means first in time was first in right. So the Native Americans have argued for a long time that since they were here before any Europeans, that they have the prior claim to water. And the courts have held that to a large degree that's true and have allocated a very substantial portion of surface water to many of the Native American tribes. However, where ranchers and farmers are concerned, uh, the, for the doctor of prior appropriation applies as well. So let's say you were the first rancher out here somewhere in Arizona, uh, and you started using water from one of the streams. And a year later, another rancher came in, and he was living upstream from you, and he wanted to use the water to your detriment. In that circumstance, that rancher might be prevented from doing that. Now, over the years, what's happened is the state has developed a whole series of priority claims. So the surface water law is not something that we have to talk a lot, a bit, a lot about, uh, but you simply have to know that in Arizona, we recognize the doctrine of prior appropriation, meaning first in time, first in right. We do not recognize what a lot of eastern states recognize, which is the common law doctrine of riparian rights. So let's talk about groundwater. In 1980, the Arizona legislature passed the Arizona Groundwater Management Act. You know, prior to 1980, Arizona was a relatively unpopulous state, but we were growing quite rapidly. And it was felt that we needed to have a much more robust groundwater management law. So the Arizona Groundwater Management Act was passed. And when we think about groundwater, we're talking about water that is percolating through or flowing through the, the ground. The level below ground at which water exists is referred to as the water table. And actually where the water table meets a lower depression, you can see there on the screen, a stream or a creek or a river is formed. And what happens is as we take water out of the ground, Nature will replenish it, but oftentimes what's happening is we're taking too much water out of the ground, not nearly enough being replaced by nature. So what are the sources of water overall here in Arizona? You can see with this chart, effluent, which is treated sewer water, is only about 2%. Groundwater composes 40% of the water sources here in Arizona. Surface water, about 19%. And then the Colorado River, which is, of course, surface water, supplies the other 39%. And we're going to talk about the Colorado River and the CAP, the Colorado uh, River Project, uh, in just a couple of minutes. Now, the government agency that supervises water here in Arizona is the Arizona Department of Water Resources. And they have three major goals relative to groundwater. They want to control overdraft, and we'll talk about overdraft more in just a second. Secondly, they want to allocate groundwater to the appropriate parties. And third, they want to create and manage supplemental sources, in particular what we'll call and what you'll know as the Central Arizona Project. Let's first talk about overdraft. What overdraft is, is the process of taking more water out of the ground than nature is replenishing. And what this does oftentimes is result in what are called fissures. Not F-I-S-H-E-R-S, but F-I-S-S-U-R-E-S. In other words, big cracks in the ground. So the ground is subsiding and uh, water is taking out, taken out from it and the, the surface of the, of the ground cracks. Fishers have become a big problem, in particular in parts of Maricopa County and Pinal County. So if you are 
uh, involved in a real estate transaction, you should be actually looking at what are called Fisher maps. You can access these on the Department of Real Estate's website uh, to see if there are Fisher problems in your area. And I said it's Maricopa and Pinal, but there are other counties, including Pima and Cochise counties, where this overdraft is occurring and fissures are being created. Another thing that happens with overdraft is subsidence of the ground. This particular photograph is one of my favorites. Uh, what it is, it shows the, the photograph was taken in 1977. That's where the man's standing. Uh, and the top uh, sign there shows 1925 or so where the level of the ground was in 1925. So the whole valley here in California has subsided some 25 or 30 feet over those years. Why? Because groundwater has been sucked out and the valley has been subsiding. That's amazing. It's just absolutely amazing. Now in Tucson, we've experienced overdraft for a long, long period of time. This particular map shows the water table. It's not subsidence, it's water table from 1940 to 1995. And right there in the center of town, the decline in the water table is over a couple of hundred feet. Now what's happened since 1995 is Colorado River water through the Central Arizona project has actually been recharged into the Tucson Basin which has actually caused the water table to rise uh, substantially here in Tucson. But uh, from 1940 to 1995, we had very substantial reduction all right, in, our, in the level of our water table. And there was some subsidence in certain areas of town, but that typically is not happening any longer because of the recharge of the Central Arizona Project water. Now, there are three main uses that water is put to in Arizona. Domestic, in other words, for our household use, agricultural, and then finally for industrial. So which one of these do you think uses the most water? Take a guess. Well, here's the answer. Agriculture uses almost 70% of the water that we use here in Arizona. Industrial, only 6% and household or municipal use, in other words, domestic use, 25%. So agriculture, what you see a lot of times in fields is what's called flood irrigation. They just pour the water out over the fields. Some of it seeps into the ground, irrigating the crops, but a lot of it just evaporates. And science and the universities are looking at new ways to try to minimize the amount of water used in agriculture. As we grow, you know, I moved to Arizona in 1970. Phoenix Metro was about 750,000 people at that time. Tucson was about 200,000 people. And now our state is well over six and a half million people. So as we grow more people, uh, more of this agricultural property is taken out of use to create subdivisions. And someone once said, you know, you can water a lot more uh, uh, you use a lot less water to water an acre of people than you do to water an acre of cotton. But still, our water is obviously rather precious and it has to be taken care of and conserved. Another goal of the Department of Water Resources is to create supplemental sources. And by far, the main supplemental source is the Central Arizona Project, water from the Colorado River brought south from Lake Havasu all the way down through Maricopa, Pignal counties and terminating here in Pima County just southwest of Tucson. And uh, the Colorado River water actually was rather controversial and in 1992 uh, where I happened to live was one of the one of the areas where they started to use Colorado River water and they simply just allowed it to flow into the into the pipes and all of a sudden, the people who were using the CAP water uh, were actually finding that their water was coming out of the faucet brown and staining their clothes when they were in laundry, and basically it was unusable. Finally, after 
a lot of political wrangling. They shut that, uh, they shut that system off and decided to try a few other things, and eventually they wound up deciding to recharge the Colorado River water. What does that mean? It means to put it back into the ground, inject it back into the ground, and let nature treat it and filter it so it actually becomes groundwater. Now, in Arizona, there are two areas that are considered to be restricted areas. In other words, where groundwater use is restricted. The first of these is what's called an irrigation non-expansion area, an INA. Now, just look at the, look at the term there, irrigation non-expansion. So this is an area where irrigation cannot be expanded. Uh, in other words, uh, no new fields can be irrigated. The second one is called an active management area, an AMA, an active groundwater management area. And these are in the areas of the highest population, as we'll see. So let's first take a look at the irrigation non-expansion areas, the INAs. There are three of them around the state, one in Joseph City, the other in Harkahala, and finally down in, the, in Cochise County in Douglas. So in these areas, if you were involved in farm and ranch brokerage uh, and you happen to be or that property was in an INA, uh, irrigation in all likelihood could not be expanded into new fields. Now the AMAs, the active groundwater management areas, are, are along the major uh, population corridor, starting down in Santa Cruz, coming up through Tucson, in through Pinal County, and up into Maricopa County, all along I-19, I-10, and I-17, and then skipping up above the Mogollon Rim uh, to Prescott. So these areas of high population obviously use a lot more of the groundwater, so the groundwater is really actively managed and restricted uh, in those particular areas. Now, there's something that the Arizona Department of Water Resources can issue called a Certificate of Assured Water Supply, which is going to be required if a subdivider is developing a subdivision in an AMA, uh, where the water is supplied by a municipality or water company. In other words, I could not just go out and drill a big well uh, if I'm in an AMA creating a subdivision. Uh, I, uh, I might get enough water out of that, but the state would not issue the public report for the subdivision because of the fact that I needed this certificate issued by the Department of Water Resources. Uh, so the water, uh, in order to be able to get a certificate of assured water supply, that water has to be delivered by either a municipality, such as Tucson Water, uh, or uh, a water company, or the Salt River Project up in Phoenix, or a water company that is authorized by the Department of Water Resources. And the developer of a subdivision, in order to get that certificate of assured water supply, is going to have to show that there's an uninterruptible 100-year supply. Now, that's not necessary. Nobody can predict what's going to happen in 100 years. But the idea being that there's a likelihood that water will be there for a very long period of time. Secondly, that the developer has the financial ability or that the water supplier has that financial ability to continue to deliver that water, and that the goals of the developer are consistent with the goals within the active groundwater management area, within the AMA. Also, in Maricopa, Pinal, and Pima counties, where the greatest water use occurs because of this within the framework of the groundwater and the CAP, there's what's called the uh, Central Arizona Groundwater Replenishment District in these three areas. The idea here is to continue to replenish as much groundwater as possible in these counties. And there's a charge for this that we as taxpayers in these in these three counties actually uh, are charged and we find that on our property tax bill every year. So let's talk a little bit more about subdivisions. In an AMA, as I mentioned, the subdivider has to obtain a certificate of assured water supply or sometimes called a 100-year certificate from the Arizona Department of Water Resources. Outside of an AMA, Let's say you're in Cochise County or Yavapai County. 
uh, where there, where you're not and you're not in an AMA. In that circumstance, what you uh, would have to provide to a, a buyer is what's called a water adequacy report. But a water adequacy report doesn't guarantee that there's water. It just states what the situation is with water, whether there is water available or maybe there's no water available. And that you would have to, you as a buyer of that property, would have to drill your own well. Speaking of wells, there are exempt wells within an AMA. Uh, in an AMA, someone can actually drill a well if the, uh, if the local authorities will allow it. Uh, and uh, that well cannot have, you cannot install a pump with a greater capacity than 35 gallons a minute. Now, if you think about it, a basic subsistence well for a family might be about a gallon a minute where they would, where that well might be pumping up a gallon a minute. And usually a family would have to have a big storage tank or a cistern to make sure that they had adequate water on a regular basis. But if you have 35 gallons a minute, which it would be rather rare for most domestic wells, uh, that's a gusher. That's just a huge amount. But here's what the law says. Uh, if you want to drill a well or have drilled a well on your property, that as long as you do not install a pump with a capacity of greater than 35 gallons per minute, then that well is exempt from any further regulation uh, within the framework of the Arizona Department of Water Resources. But a permit, of course, to drill a well is required. The state wants to make sure that they are aware of where uh, and, uh, and what wells are. So you can actually go on the Department of Water Resources website and look to see uh, where various wells are. You're listing a property, you can go on the ADWR website and actually take a look at that well or where the well is and, uh, and pull up the well report when the well was drilled. Now, when the Groundwater Act was passed in 1980, uh, there were certain rights which are grant, were grandfathered in. In other words, if you were using water, if you had been using water irrigating your fields prior to 1980, uh, shouldn't you be allowed to continue to irrigate those fields after 1980? The answer is yes, so long as you filed the proper paperwork. All right, and there are three types of grandfathered water rights. The first of these is an irrigation grandfathered water right. In other words, you were irrigating your field all through the 60s and 70s, irrigating your crops, uh, and uh, you filed the proper paperwork prior to the law coming into effect in 1980, uh, you have a grandfathered irrigation right. And that irrigation right is, as uh, being grandfathered, runs with the land. In other words, you can't separate it from the land. You can't sell your water rights to somebody else, even though you, you're no longer irrigating that field. So that grandfathered irrigation right transfers with the land and cannot be sold separately. The second grandfathered right is called a type one non-irrigation right. And take a look at your course material. What you'll see here is a type one non-irrigation right. Water has been retired from irrigation and it can be used for industry or for a subdivision. So in that circumstance, what you typically have is water has been retired again, no longer use it, used for irrigation. Uh, and a developer might come in and put in a subdivision, as this developer did. This is a photograph or two of Rancho Sarita down south of Tucson, where they, uh, they made a man-made lake uh, and a water park, uh, and this Type 1 non-irrigation right allows them to do that. In this particular circumstance, the Type 1 non-irrigation right also goes with the land. In other words, the water right cannot be sold separately from the land, but it runs with and would be transferred with the land. The third type is called a type two non-irrigation right. And a type two non-irrigation right, as your notes say, it is based on historical groundwater pumping for a non-irrigation use. Non-irrigation use, such as livestock watering, industry, or maybe a golf course. Now, this Type 2 non-irrigation right is probably the rarest of these, and this can be sold separately from the land. So if somebody has a Type 2 non-irrigation right, they can actually sell that water right, not, not having sold the land, but just sell the water right separately from the land. 
So that's our discussion here on Arizona water law.